Hello, my name is Zizel Slipovich, and I'm a musician in residence at Yale University's Fortune of Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies. This video series is designed as a companion to our album Where is Our Homeland, which is the first volume in the archive's ongoing effort to present songs and poems performed by survivors in testimonies given to the Fortune of Archive over the last 40 years. You can learn more about the project on the archive's website, songsfromtestimonies.org. Where is Our Homeland? Songs from Testimonies Volume 1 was recorded in 2019 by the Zizel Slepovich Ensemble featuring renowned singer Sasha Luria, Craig Udelman on the violin, Joshua Camp on the accordion, keyboards and guitar, Dmitry Ishenko on the bass and myself on woodwinds. The songs in this collection differ vastly in terms of style, social and historical background, language and many other aspects, but collectively they create a multidimensional picture of Jewish life before and during World War II. Several songs that we are presenting here were actually the beginning of this music project carried out by the archive, and they all came from Lubov K's testimony. Uh, Lubov K was born and raised and lived her life in Zvenigorodka in Ukraine. And she ended up with many of her fellow citizens in a slave labor camp, suffering hunger, cold, tortures, loss of family, friends, and homes. Two of her four songs that she presented did not have any music. She recited them as poems. So I took liberty to write music to those poems in the style that would be adequate and representative of the music popular at the time in Eastern Europe and in the Soviet Union, in Ukraine possibly. Um, and this song that tells the story of Stepan, the Ukrainian collaborationist guard, an extremely cruel person, uh, I used the uh, genres of tango, which was a very young genre at the time, and military march. I sometimes turned to military feel there. Stepan Blandin is a shootsman, very strong. On the day and night, he sits on the swing. Свою он службу выполняет честно и за порядком верного он следит. Наши ребята очень непослушны, своего блондина слушать не хотят. Лишь только он успеет отвернуться, в село, как зайцы, быстро все летят. И вот однажды храбрая десятка в село в день отдыха себе ушла. Узнав об этом на дневной проверке, Блондин решил их проучить слегка. Пришли они, блондин их подзывает. Где были вы? Кто разрешил идти? Вы нам простите, больше мы не будем. Прошу, ответил, но мыслил, погоди. На второй день, собрав свою десятку, он на расправу к немцу их повел. Пропали мы, нам больше не вернуться. За кусок хлеба нам конец пришел. Но, к сожалению, все домой вернулись. Там угощение сдало их наять. Блондин готовил вкусный сладкий завтрак своей десятке крепких двадцать пять. Шум пол свистел, и стоны раздавались, и по ребятам плач и страх ходил. А в стороне сидел блондин довольный, что непослушных так ловко проучил. Только он успеет отвернуться в село Казань. 
A month after Lyubov K. and her fellow prisoners were taken from the Zvenigorodka ghetto to the Nyemerzh labor camp north of the city, conditions in the camp became so crowded that the German authorities decided to split the camp in two. Lyubov and half of the Nyemerzh prisoners were transferred to Smilchinsi, a village approximately 12 kilometers northwest of Nyemerzh. Later that year, on November 2, 1942, the German gendarmerie liquidated the Nyamarosh camp, executing all of the prisoners who remained there. Lyubov K. and the other prisoners who had been transferred to Smilchense remained there until December 1942, when they were transferred yet again, this time to Budishche, a village eight kilometers northeast of Smilchense. Conditions in Budishche were somewhat better than in Nyamarosh and Smilchense, for two main reasons. First, the prisoners were housed in a village clubhouse rather than in barns. As Lyubov recalls, quote, the building wasn't heated, but the floor was wooden instead of dirt, and at least it was an enclosed space, end quote. Second, the villagers of Budishche and the nearby village of Shistrinsi were remarkably generous towards the labor camp prisoners. Lyubov recalls, quote, they were wonderful people. All we can do is say thank you to them for the rest of our lives. Of course, we would like to express our gratitude to them somehow. They would come to the camp. They would persuade the polizai, bring us half liters, bring us pieces of bread, a potato here and there, and if they lived nearby, something hot to eat. They really supported us, end quote. As time went on, the prisoners themselves became more daring. On their way back to the camp after a hard day's labor on the Transit Highway 4 project, they would run in pairs into the village to beg for something to eat. It was one such foray into a neighboring village that inspired the song Stepan. As Lyubov recalls, in general, the Ukrainian auxiliary police who guarded the camp would turn a blind eye to the prisoners' brief absences. As Lyubov puts it, quote, the polizai had been with us so long they knew that we wouldn't run away, end quote. While these temporary absences could be overlooked, any actual escape would entail severe consequences for the remaining prisoners in the camp. The German overseers had a rule that if one prisoner ran away from the camp, ten innocent prisoners would be shot. This threat proved to be a strong deterrent against any plans of escape. As Lyubov puts it, quote, we didn't want to be the cause of others' death. We decided that whatever happened, it would happen to all of us together, end quote. So despite the guards' generally permissive attitude towards temporary absences, on one unfortunate Sunday, Lyubov and nine other prisoners snuck out to the village during a roll call. The blonde guard Stepan met them at the gate as they returned, demanding to know where they had been. The prisoners apologized profusely and promised not to venture out again. Much to their surprise, Stepan didn't punish anyone immediately. Instead, he waited until the following day, Monday. During that morning's roll call, he demanded, the ten of you, step forward. While everyone else was taken out to work in the forest that day, Stepan took his ten unfortunate prisoners to Lysenko. The group was fully convinced that they were being taken to the gendarmerie to be shot. But instead, Stepan took them to the highway department in Lysenko, where the director and foreman of the highway department worked. There they were greeted by a young, mean German by the name of Hans. Hans ordered Stepan to give them each 20 lashes with a ramrod. And that is exactly what Stepan did. The following day, Tuesday, Lyubov and the other nine prisoners ate their usual breakfast of watery gruel, and then, one by one, Stepan and one other guard gave them each 25 lashes with a ramrod in the kitchen. As Lyubov recalls, quote, we crawled out of the kitchen on all fours, and after that beating, we went back to work, end quote. 
To immortalize this agonizing experience, the prisoners wrote a song describing the brutality of handsome yet heartless Stepan. Like the other three songs that Lubov shares in her testimony, this ode to Stepan was composed collectively by the prisoners. As Lubov explains, quote, everyone wrote the songs all together. This one would give a word, that one would give two, this one a line, and the next would add another. That's how it came together for us. While the lyrics of this song describe their ordeal in unflinchingly factual terms, in a certain sense, by writing this song, the prisoners were able to have the last laugh at Stepan's expense. He tried to break their will, and yet they still had the power to compose a song about their blonde tormentor. Because songs like these were not committed to paper, but instead were memorized, if even one of the camp inmates survived, their collective history would survive as well, along with the identity of their tormentors. While Lubov does not shy away from describing the cruelty of Ukrainian collaborators like Stepan, her testimony also pays grateful tribute to the local Ukrainian villagers who brought food to Lubov and her fellow prisoners while they were in the Budyshche labor camp. Complex accounts of collaboration and compassion are just one of the aspects that make survivor testimonies like Lubov's completely invaluable in preserving the history of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm.